So um, I won't take questions. That's the beauty of being the chair. <laughs> so, so it's my huge pleasure to um, um, invite Baroness Dido Harding to give us the NHS perspective of how we do this in, a, in an absolutely trustworthy way. As you know, um, Dido was chair of NHS Improvement and is now working in partnership with colleagues at NHS England to do great things for the citizens of the UK. So could I ask you to welcome Dido. Thanks, Andrew. Um, I always try and avoid speaking behind podiums because I'm conscious you probably can't actually see me. Um, I come at this, um, Andrew's been very kind, about the, the collaborative work we're aiming to do together with NHS Improvement and NHS England. But I actually come at this as a, a civilian, if you like. I am neither a data scientist nor a doctor. Uh, and I was slightly heartened by, Andrew, your, your graph showing different sectors, that uh, where I've come from, I spent eight years in the telecom sector. So for a moment, I felt encouraged that telecoms and tech were in your far right-hand corner uh, <laughs> box. But actually, I, I spent eight years at TalkTalk Talk saying that I was running an internet service provider that was learning how to use the internet. Because the reality is we are all the generation who are learning how to use the technology as we lead. We didn't grow up with it. Um, we do remember a world without it. Um, and we're having to grapple with the ethical, moral, and sort of leadership challenges of the digital world. And I feel really strongly, and I, I did in my old job at TalkTalk Talk as well, that we owe, we're the generation that really has to work this out because the rules of the game were reasonably clear before digital uh, arrived, and we can remember that. We can remember a society where what was right and wrong um, in the physical world was well-grounded and established, at least in Western democracies. Um, I, I feel very strongly that we have to help chart what, that's, what is right and wrong in the digital realm um, right now. Um, because actually our children and the younger generation can't remember the world that didn't exist. Um, uh, and if you look today, if you just do a quick screen down and pull down the, the BBC News um, app, you will see today the Information Commissioner um, announcing the uh, new code for age-appropriate design for online devices that children use. And she makes a statement that, you no, know, it is quite extraordinary that we've had to work out 15 years after children started using digital devices, how we might need to make them safe for children. Could you imagine having that discussion about toys? You know, that, you know, is it necessary to have a code on how to be sure that a physical toy is safe for children? But actually, the tech world has been having a debate about whether it's necessary to define what's safe online for children for the last five years. And it's, for those of us that have campaigned for it, quite a landmark that we've actually agreed we do need to define that code. Now, the good news about health is actually the health sector worked out a long, long, long time ago that um, ethics and what we do with our patients' data was a really important part of the social contract. So I think um, what I'd like to start with is asking, you know, why, why here and why now do we need to debate this further? Because it, this has been an intrinsic part of medicine for a very, very long time. And I would argue that here and now really do matter. Um, the, the, the now, because as Andrew's just sort of shown us so brilliantly, uh, the world is changing at a speed that no one could have predicted. Uh, in the last five years, we've accumulated more health data um, than in the whole of human history. And that's accelerating. 30% of all data that is stored in the world is health data. So this is enormous. And as Andrew has set out far more eloquently than I, bigger than any one organization or any one country. Um, so now is a point of ta in time where we really do have to grapple with this if we're going to benefit, bring the benefits that's so clearly available to society from, from leveraging the insight that can come from large pools of health data. <sighs> So now matters because the world has changed so much and if we're not careful it will accelerate away from us and we won't have built the societal trust and the scaffolding, the moral and legal and ethical scaffolding that 
that enables us all to collaborate. Um, and, and here matters as well, here as in, in London, in the UK. It matters here because, because of the NHS and because of our extraordinary academic institutions. Now, that's the kernel of the life sciences strategy, um, but it means that the UK has a, an opportunity to play a leading role in this endeavour. Um, and that will be good for us as a country, and I'd argue essential for us as a, as a world. Um, we have a responsibility as well as an opportunity. So the here and now really matter. Uh, and, and I feel that responsibility, as I say, as a civilian in this discussion, very keenly um, in my role chairing NHS improvement and sort of collaborating with NHS England. Uh, so I thought I'd talk you through what we are thinking about in NHS E and I and X. Everyone has to have a letter of the alphabet after their NHS. Uh, um, how we do this, how we maximise the benefit of, um, of health data and, cr and, and enable its exploitation legally, um, securely, ethically, and probably most importantly, transparently. Because if we can do that, um, there is a huge opportunity for this country and a huge opportunity for the planet. So uh, the logic that we are taking is that we are stewarding a system, not an organisation. It's the first lesson you learn when you come like me as an outsider into the NHS that it is not an organisation, it is a system. Um, and it's 10% of the UK economy, so it's an enormous and complex system. And therefore, if you're looking to drive change from the centre, you need to think about how you're going to influence and shape that change rather than command and control it. It is too big and too complex. All of you know far better than I the di distinction between a complex system and a complicated one. A complicated one, you can do a straightforward logic decision tree and drive change. A complex one does not work like that. So if we're going to affect change from the centre of the NHS on this agenda, we have to remember that we're part of a complex system. And that means it's about setting direction, setting a vision. It's about giving guidance, agreeing standards, encouraging and supporting implementation rather than telling. And that's very much at the core of the role NHS X needs to play. So where should we be setting those standards? I want to just take you through three things. Firstly, um, the, uh, the role of the commercial sector. Now, uh, Chris Wormald, the permanent secretary in DHSC, said to me on Friday, uh, if you go back 40 years, the first episode of Yes Minister is about data protection. Isn't that extraordinary? Uh, and transparency, and how government works with the private sector, shock horror, um, to manage these things. Um, so this is not new, uh, but we really do need the, 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 the alchemy that comes from the great power of our single-payer public health system called the NHS and the innovation uh, and force for change that comes from the private sector and academia. So what we've got to do is set um, standards and codes that encourage that work. So for the NHS, we're very keen to make sure that we're clear what good looks like for NHS organisations to ensure that there is a fair share of the benefits for the NHS, for patients, for citizens and for organisations that are innovating in this space. There has to be a fair deal for everyone. Um, the Office for Life Sciences have published a, a draft policy framework in the um, second life sciences sector deal and it's based on five guiding principles. And, the challenge of this is the principles are really straightforward. None of you will disagree with the principles. The challenge is in the doing. So if you just run through the principles, firstly, that, that if we're doing anything with patient data, it needs to be, and it's outside of direct patient care, there needs to be an explicit aim that the work is there to improve the health and welfare of patients in the NHS. If we're using NHS data, the work needs to have within its brief an explicit aim to improve the health and well-being of NHS patients. The second principle is there do need to be fair terms for the NHS organisation that isn't reaching a commercial agreement with uh, another organisation to use their data that is fair for the NHS organisation itself but also for the whole NHS system. We do need everyone to remember that they are part of that system and not only their, their own organisation. So you have to think about both. Thirdly, it's important that we don't undermine or inhibit 
the impact our, or, or impact our ability to maximise the value nationally of that local patient data. So if you're an NHS organisation doing a local patient data deal, you do have to have a mind to how your deal might affect the ability to, to use that data at a national level. Fourthly, um, and I probably think this should have come first, it has to be transparent. It has to be clear what you're planning on doing. The just, no, go back to that Yes Minister episode. It, there is no excuse anymore for not being transparent about what you're intending to do. And if you think you're being transparent, you probably still need to be more so. It's that sort of golden rule that once you've got bored of telling people something, they're just about ready to hear you. So we think we mean it. No one actually, I believe, goes out not to be transparent about what they're doing, but you have to keep going and going and going in the way that you're operating and trying even harder. Um, and then finally, the fifth principle, which in some ways shouldn't need writing down, but because the complexity of this landscape it does, is that any commercial agreements that NHS organisations are making with other parties needs to properly understand and be compliant with all of the obligations in GDPR, all of the obligations in the National Data Guardians guidance, etc. And the problem with the etc. is that that legal landscape is very complicated. I defy anyone here to really properly, on their own, single-handedly understand how GDPR works, for example. Um, and so that requires us to think very carefully about what we're committing to and be honest and bring in people to help us define those agreements. So, you know, because the NHS is a system with many hundreds of different organisations all holding patient data, actually implementing those five principles is a non-trivial ask. It requires considerable skill building. That's my, take me back to my point about being an ISP learning how to use the internet. Uh, these are skills that are not common around an NHS boardroom table. They're not common around the NHS Improvement NHS England boardroom table either. And I think we've all got to... We can't be the generation that abdicates this in the way that my parents abdicated the use of the, the programming of the VCR when I was a teenager. Actually, if we hold leadership positions in health organisations, we have to take time ourselves to understand the implications in the data space. And, and my personal learning from having been a tech chief exec and not being a, a software engineer is that if you put data scientists and engineers under enough pressure, you know they can speak English. They really can. Um, they will only speak English if those of us who are not data scientists and engineers really want to hear them. And, and are open about our desire to learn and understand the human consequences of the work they're doing. And actually, the, the wonderful alchemy of the non-scientist and the, and the scientists coming together and understanding each other's world is what makes this work actually sing. And that's what we have to do in applying those principles. So what are the challenges to doing that? Um, I think there are two really big challenges. Um, the first one, Andrew's laid out very, very well, which is public trust. My point around, if you think you're doing enough to build public trust, keep going. Do a bit more, because this is really hard um, and potentially really scary. And we should all be honest that the history, and you know, I say, feel this every day in my new role um, as interim chair at Genomics England, is that the, the history of data science and medicine is not brilliant. It really isn't, and, and we live in a, in a world where the opportunities presented by this data are so enormous, but so are the risks. No, it's not the technology itself that is morally good or morally evil. It's the human beings that apply the moral judgment and, and affect it. So, so the way we build public trust in how we act is so important. And there are some really exciting examples of people doing this very well. So if you haven't looked at it before, have a look at Health North's Connected Health Cities pilots. Have a look at their hashtag Data Saves Lives um, public engagement program. Um, we all need to be doing that multiplied by 10. Um, because there is such an enormous prize, as Ara has set out, whether it's in breast cancer, whether it's... Well, it, let me, you can take any 
clinical area. The opportunity for data science to genuinely save lives is huge. But we have to make the argument. We have to explain. Um, we have to be honest when things go wrong. Um, and because you earn that trust um, in, in long, slow steps, one after another. Um, and, and there is a lot that we have to do in, and I speak about this again and again in the NHS, which is about shifting the culture in the way that we operate within the NHS to be less blame, more learning. And it's really true in this space too, because we earn public trust when we're honest about things that go wrong with, with data. Um, we, we lose public trust instantly when we hide. Uh, so I think there's a role for all of us to play in that. Um, and then there is a technology role as well, a technology challenge, because it's, if you're working locally, um, a lot of the data is, uh, is easily accessible. Um, as a layman, I think if you went out on the street and asked people, um, does the NHS hold all the data in one place, people would expect that we do. They don't recognise, the general public doesn't recognise that we're a system with lots of different disaggregated pools of data. And they get so frustrated when in clinical care, I get so frustrated when I'm asked five times for the same data when I bring my uh, you know, children uh, through A&E or to see their GP that we don't have that genuinely longitudinal um, read of data that Andrew set out. And we shouldn't diminish the technology challenge in doing that. Um, but my goodness, we've got to get it. And we've got to think how, from the centre, we provide the right support and challenge and money to drive the, what is actually the world's largest digital transformation. That's the brief that we've given Matthew Gould and NHSX to set out a strategy <laughs> for the world's largest digital transformation so that we can actually get to where a lot of our, our stakeholders believe we are today, a lot of our citizens, where all the data is held in one place, both for patients and for researchers. And I think that's the, that's the holy grail. Now, easy for me to talk about this sort of passionately in theory, but now is the time. If you go back to why here and why now, we have so much on our side to be the best at this in the world, and now is the moment to do it. Actually, a decade ago, interoperable systems weren't something that anyone understood or was thinking about. It was the world of very large, single system implementations. Technology has made it easier for us to build interoperable data uh, systems in the UK. And we have, unlike most other countries in the world, the health system that should enable us to do it. So I'm very conscious I've talked in theory, and I bow to the much greater knowledge in the room, in, the pra in practice. But I found, I found as, a, as, a, as a civilian in this space, if you go back to those basic principles of trust and transparency, and remember that the more you know about this, the less likely you are to remember that the general public is going to need you to repeat it again and again and again we have a fighting chance of, of delivering the extraordinary benefits that researchers and clinicians can already see really at their fingertips. Thanks very much.